Mark chapter 5. Looking in Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 21. We have a teaching, a statement of a parable, an understanding that is in many ways two parables, two teachings, two miracles in one. Jesus had just uh, finished with the man with legion on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. He had left Capernaum and traveled there by boat with his disciples, and a great storm arose. And he calmed the storm and then continued on to Gennesara. And there he met a man with thousands of demons. And he cleansed him of the demons, cast them out into a herd of pigs. And this caused people to fear Jesus, because here was somebody with great power, great ability, and as many people today will look at somebody like Jesus and not really know what's going on because Jesus has this great power and yet I cannot steer it, I cannot control it, Jesus is doing whatever he wants and that scares people because if power is out there, if the holiness of God is out there, then eventually it might come for me. And so that is a lot of the fear that is in the Gospels. That is a lot of the fear today when people push away God is because they do not know what God is going to do. They fear what God is going to do to them, perhaps, if we start talking about a holy God. And so they say, please leave. They're very gentle and respectful about this. And Jesus says, okay. And he gets in the boat and leaves the healed man to spread the gospel on that side of the Sea of Galilee. And he gets in the boat and he comes back to Capernaum. And when he gets back to Capernaum, they have a different response than those on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. The other side of the Sea of Galilee, they feared him. They pushed him away in Capernaum. They were waiting for him, it says, that they... They knew that he would come back, and so they were hanging out on the seashore waiting for him to come back. They were waiting for him. They missed him. They wanted him to come back, and so he comes back, and everybody gathers around him, and he probably got had time to get out of the boat uh, because people are pressing around him on all sides. Uh, He doesn't get too far out of the boat, and he sits down, and he starts teaching and healing. You have basically three different groups of people in Capernaum at this time. You have those who had experienced healing and who have experienced freedom, and to them, Jesus is a hero. Jesus is, you know, the greatest thing out there. And I want to spend time with him because he brought healing and he brought uh, freedom to them. There are those who uh, perhaps need healing themselves or uh, have loved ones who are healed and they are waiting in line. They are pushing in to get healing. And then there are others who are just looking to see what this amazing miracle worker is saying. And because of that, The crowds got bigger and bigger and bigger, and people are coming from all sides. And so, in the midst of this throng that has surrounded Jesus on the seashore, a guy comes, and it doesn't really say how he got through the crowd, but his name is Jairus. And it says that Jairus was a ruler of the synagogue. Now, a synagogue was the... Church of the Jews, okay? The Jews still have synagogues today. They are all over the place, and you will see names like Beth Temple something or other is kind of how they name things on the West Coast, and that is a Jewish synagogue. And the synagogue is a, is a going concern, even back then. The synagogue was the hub of Jewish activity, 
They would have classes during the week. They would actually have what we would consider college-level classes on the Jewish Bible, on the Talmud, being taught by professors, uh, learned people in the synagogue building. There would be various classes for young women on how to be good wives and classes on, for men on how to be good husbands and teaching not only the truths of Scripture but the application of Scripture for the family. Then on Saturday you would have people who would come to their uh, Sabbath service and they would all come and they would meet and like today you would have the men on one side and the women on the other. The men and women do not sit together in a synagogue because they feel that that would promote uh, distraction, lack of focus, okay? If you are, you know, little, 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 with your family and so all the men over here and all the women over there and Somebody's got to run this. You don't just unlock the doors and say, have at it. Somebody has to hire the teachers. Somebody has to make sure that the fires are built if it's a cold Saturday for the Saturday service to happen. Somebody has to run the synagogue and there would be a group of rulers or elders and they were called synagogue elders or synagogue rulers. Both things are used throughout the Gospels and Jairus was the head, and if it was a large synagogue, the, the historical record seems to indicate the minimum number of elders it took to run a, synagogue, run a synagogue was three. The most it took was seven. So he was one of this group that would hire the teachers, that would make sure that the scheduling of the rooms was good, that would make sure that uh, he also made sure that what, during a synagogue service, and uh, you can actually see this on YouTube if you want to see one, they would bring in from the back, there would be a large cabinet, usually gold, and they would go and the rabbis would open the cabinet and this scroll would be brought out and the cover would be taken off the scroll and the scroll would be laid out then the reader would be brought up and you would they would have professional readers to make sure they didn't mispronounce words and they would read through whatever the passage of the day was and so you had to make sure that the scroll was there if they showed up on sabbath you know the sabbath for their service and the rabbis open the cabinet and the scroll is out for cleaning or something that would be disruptive. And so the, the dance and the organization of this hubbub of Jewish society was run by the rulers of the synagogue and they would be hired to do this. This would be a full-time job, kind of like church administrators today in larger churches you have full-time administrators who administrate the church. And this is what he was doing. And so he had weight. He had chutzpah. He had, you know, he spoke and people said, what? And so he had a name that was known. Now, people have speculated, well, was he a Pharisee? Because somebody that high up, somebody that learned you figure, well, he's probably, you know, gone down the Pharisee path, but the Bible never calls him a Pharisee. We don't know. If he was, he probably did, you know, if he wasn't, he probably knew Pharisees. And if he knew Pharisees, he knew the conflict between the established religion and Jesus. He knew that people were having difficulties, what Jesus was saying about God and the acceptance of God by common folk. And so, you put all that together, that he has weight, that he has knowledge of things, he's probably heard and maybe even witnessed some of the greater miracles in the Capernaum area. If you recall, Jesus spent several nights at Peter's mother-in-law's house in Capernaum, and it says in the earlier parts of the gospel, he healed all who came. And so there is, a, there is people talking about this and people speculating about this. And I'm sure Jairus hears about this. Now Jairus 
has a daughter. And in one of the Gospels, it says small, in the other it says she's 12 years old. So she's 12 years old, and 12 years old is actually pretty old in Jewish uh, culture. You have a, a culture back in Jesus' time where people were not living to be 80 or 90, okay? Average age in Jesus' day was 40, not only because of the wars the Romans were fighting, they would come and draft you and say, aha, come beat you in my army, and then you'd, you know, die young because you're in the Roman army. And that's why if you reached 50, you were considered blessed by God, you were considered wise beyond your years because you're beating the average age. And so when we look at Mary... Okay, Mary's betrothed. Mary then becomes pregnant by the Holy Spirit. You look at history back time, she was probably 14, okay, when Mary became the mother of Jesus. And so when you hit 12, man, you're ready to be betrothed and, you know, you're looking for suitors and stuff. So she is becoming a woman, but Jairus still says, my little girl. Okay? He still sees her as his little girl. Probably had a mother at home. The mother would not travel to go to Jesus. The mother would stay home with the daughter who was dying. Okay? In two of the Gospels, it says she's dead. In one of the Gospels, it says she's dying and dies later in the story. Okay? She is going to die. Okay, that's t next week's miracle, though. <laughs> so, he says, come, come. My daughter, or my daughter, problems, dead, dying, come, come, come. And Jesus says, okay. So he stands up, and like a probably Laurel and Hardy movie, you see the whole crowd stand up with him, and they all kind of move in mass because it says a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. So Jesus is moving, and if you have a helicopter, you're seeing this group of a thousand people, you know, just... And Jesus is in there somewhere. But he's going to Jairus' house. And he's going to Jairus' house to heal and raise Jairus' daughter. He says, I will go do this. Okay? So then he's heading along, and his, his miracle trip is interrupted. Okay, this is an interruption miracle. There's a woman. We do not know her name. She had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and people have drawn similarities. Jairus had a 12-year-old daughter. This person had a disease that lasted 12 years, and can we make something of that? I don't know. 12 and 12. There's clearly, we are supposed to look at these two miracles together and say, Rich, powerful person needs Jesus. Poor, insignificant woman needs Jesus. Okay? So she has a discharge of blood. This is a hemorrhage. If looking at this and the three Gospels that have this story, people have speculated, could be a tumor, could be uterine cancer. Okay? To have a continually, 24-7, flow of blood is something that is drastic. And if you look at the Old Testament and in Leviticus, what does it say about somebody who has, I cut my finger and I'm bleeding, okay? What does Leviticus say? Leviticus says, I'm unclean. I have shed my own blood. Because I have shed my own blood and I am now ceremonially unclean, according to the Old Testament, I cannot go to synagogue. I cannot go to the tabernacle back then or the temple in later years. I cannot participate in Passover. My family would do Passover over here, and I would sit outside. I could hear, I could listen, I could eat the food, but I can't participate in Passover. Can't participate in the Day of Atonement can't participate in the new year, can't participate in anything because I am ceremonially unclean because I have shed my own blood. Okay? How long? So I put a Band-Aid on it. You know, I put pressure on it and I do this. 
and it stops bleeding, the Bible says it has to stop bleeding for seven days. If after seven days, people look at my finger, no blood, I am now clean. So it isn't forever if I, you know, cut myself or scrape myself. It is a one week. It is a one week time that is allowed for it to heal. Now, if I get a blood infection, which we think is what they're talking about, then it will not stop after seven days, okay? And so you have some sort of communicable disease, they think, and so that's the whole deal. And so you have a woman who is continually shedding her own blood for 12 years. She is so on the unclean scale, she is through the roof. Pharisees would have nothing to do with her. Synagogue people would have nothing to do with her. Jairus, in his synagogue, would see her come in and would ask her to sit outside, being a gentleman. He wouldn't yell at her or anything, but he would notice she is unclean, and so she cannot participate in the holy things of God. Secondly, I don't know if you have had any situation like this, but we have... We used to have commercials for Geritol. We had Geritol because you had iron poor blood. One thing that blood does is it carries iron, which allows you to carry oxygen, which allows your hemoglobin to bounce around your body and get oxygen everywhere and nutrients everywhere. And iron is a necessary part of that. If you are continually, if you have a hemorrhage, an internal hemorrhage, your iron is going to be down. She was weak. She probably didn't have the stamina to stand. Okay? You had society against her. She couldn't go to the market. She couldn't go to the synagogue. She, everybody, you know, when little kids are raised, they would talk about Sally down the street. Well, she's perpetually unclean, they would say. We stay away from her because she has this disease. Now it says she suffered under many physicians who had spent all she had and was no better but grew worse. Now if you have a Talmud, a Talmud is the Old Testament plus commentary from multiple rabbis. Okay, So it's, a Talmud is a study book that is not only the Bible but study material. There are actually 11 solutions or cures in the Talmud for a hemorrhage, okay? Most of them are silly. For example, if you have a hemorrhage and you're a woman, then you go and you burn an ostrich egg and you take the ashes and you put it in a cotton bag and you carry it with you. And the Talmud says that will cause the bleeding to stop. Now, my guess is she went to a physician, and they told her this and then said $500, and she gave them money. It says she spent all her money on them. So these physicians for these speculative superstition cures are costing money, and she's now broke. It says she has spent all she had. Now, women back then did not work. They had family money. They manage the money that was earned by the husband. So her husband is broke. Her husband probably left her since she's out here on her own because she took all of his money for physicians. And she's not better. In fact, she's getting worse. And if you have a person who has this type of blood loss and it says she's getting worse, she may be on the verge of death. She may only have couple months, couple weeks left because there's nothing else that can be done. And so she says to herself, and the verb says to herself in 28, for she said, she said continually. This was her mantra. This was something she said over and over and over and over and over as she was heading to Jesus. If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. Okay, that's her plan, that's her thought, that is what she is going to do. 
She was probably low to the ground because she had no energy, and she, you know, pushed away by the feet of people who were standing there, and she touches the edge of Jesus' garment. And immediately, the blood dried up. She stopped bleeding. The hemorrhage had stopped. And she felt in her body that she was well. Now, every single healing that Jesus does, the only thing that's presented to us is the symptom. We do not know the root cause of this. We just know the symptom. Jesus knows the root cause. If it's a tumor, tumor's gone. Uterine cancer, that's gone. If it's whatever's inside that's causing this disease to hemorrhaging to happen, it is fixed, it is done, it is cured, it is completely cured. Jesus didn't just stop the bleeding and leave the tumor. He cured the root cause and the symptom of bleeding stopped as a result and she could feel in her body that things were different, that things were changed, perhaps pain was gone, perhaps strength returned, perhaps Jesus in his healing also raised the iron level of her blood so that she could stand up. When Jesus heals things, it is always instant and complete. You need no recuperation from Jesus' healing. And so whatever it took to get her to stand up, Jesus did in the healing. Then Jesus said... Who touched me? And his disciples said, come on, what are you talking about? These 4,000 people just touched you. And he says, no, I felt the power go out of me. In other words, the power of God healed this person. Now, the power of God is not a force. Like in Star Wars, it's not out there. It is directed. Jesus let the power go out of him. He knew it was the woman. He says, who touched me? to get everybody else to realize what's going on. Jesus is not seeking information. Okay? But he knew the healing was taking place. He knew from eternity past that this woman was going to be there and that she was going to be healed. Jesus doesn't have to look at somebody to heal. He didn't have to say anything. He can be teaching over here and heal somebody over here. No problem. That is what Jesus did. And so she stands up. And she says, it was me, tells the story, everything is uh, taken care of. And then in 34, and he, Jesus, said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Now, if you look at the various words in the Bible, they are in Greek. And they are translated into English so that we can know how to talk about them. There is a word that is used throughout the New Testament for healing, and it's iome. Okay, if somebody is fixed, if you put a Band-Aid on somebody, if you give somebody, you know, an oil or something like that to make them feel better, it is iome. Okay, it is physical healing. Luke, being a physician in his gospel, always used therapizo, where we get therapy from, okay? He doesn't use Iome because he's a doctor and he knows the fancy words, so he uses therapy for healing. When we look at this passage in 34, daughter, your faith has made you well. The word well is not Iome. It's not therapizo, it's zozo, S-O-Z-O. S-O-Z-O means saved from your sin. Jesus is declaring her faith has saved her and you've been healed from your disease. Jesus' first concern, thought, is saving her from her sin and then healing her disease. Now it says your faith has saved you. Where is the faith in this passage? Faith is when you put legs to, your, to what God has said. Looking at this, we would have to believe that the phrase, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well, somehow that was revealed to her. 
either through a rabbi's teaching or a dream or the voice of God or something, it was revealed by a spiritual source that if she does this, she's going to be healed. And her faith, we see, was her getting out of bed and crossing across town and crawling up to Jesus and touching his garment. That is the faith, that is the legs to what was revealed to her. And so in, in, in looking at this, we see what is, you know, there's this lady. She has nothing in society. She has nothing, total absolute outcast. She is going to die of her disease. And somehow it is revealed to, to her, Jesus is going to fix this. All you got to do is touch his garment. And she says, got it. She could have said, I don't believe it, and died. She could have said, that's not true, and died. But she said, I'm going to do it, and that faith to come up to Jesus and touch his garment saved her. We will get to see her in heaven, and we will get to be friends with her because Jesus declared her forgiven of her sins and, of her, and that she is saved. Jesus took time for her. Jesus allowed himself to be interrupted. Jesus had no problem meeting her need, even though he was kind of pretending he didn't know she was there. She knew she was there. And in doing it, Jesus saved her from her sins. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we do praise your name that you are a God who is available, that we do not have to wait in line, that we can bring all of our needs to you directly, and in doing so, we can be saved. Lord, we praise you for that, and ask your blessing on the meal that is to follow. We ask this through the blood of Christ. Amen.